Now we're back right live. I'm Jerry Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. This is Transitional Justice. Um, and the title of our show today is uh, 2022, a key year for Colombia, transitional justice in Colombia in 2022. And we have our special guest from Project Expedite Justice, an intern there. Her name is Natalia Venegas uh, Arango. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Buenas noches, Jay. Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I really so admire anybody from Project Expedite Justice. So tell me what you do for them and how long you've been doing it and your mission in life, if you will. Okay, so I've been working with PJ for the past uh, three months. I've been an intern and I work with the Ethiopian team on human rights violations. and. Um, what I would like to do is keep working um, on human rights, maybe raise advocacy for it and try to fight against crimes against humanity, please. Yeah. So are you a lawyer? Yes, I'm a lawyer and I also studied international relations. Okay, very important. I, are you one um, of, a, of a number of people like that you know, or are you the only one in your crowd? Um, I'm not sure a lot of people actually decide to study two degrees, um, but some of us um, actually lo love uh, both things and couldn't decide of either of them. So, so are you from Colombia? Yes, I'm Colombian. So do you want to go elsewhere and uh, investigate war crimes and atrocities, uh, or are you happy to stay in Colombia? No, I would like to go. Um, I would like to work one day, maybe for an international organization, maybe do my master's degrees um, in Europe, um, especially in human rights. So I would love to do that. Yeah, there are plenty of Project Expedite Justice people in, in Ukraine mm -hmm. right now as we speak. That's and awesome. we talked to one of your colleagues just a couple of weeks ago. That was pretty extraordinary. And then I found that the very same day and that I talked to him, um, he was talking to my brother's class at Yale Law School. Um, and that was quite something. Uh, so you guys get around. Project Expedite Justice is everywhere. It's uh, from Colombia to um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to uh, Ukraine to Yale Law School, everywhere. Anyway, uh, you called the show 2022 a key year for Colombia, and I need to I need to know why. Why is 2022 a key year? Because I think it's a key year actually worldwide. But why is it a key year for Colombia? Yes, uh, I also agree with you. I think it's a key year worldwide, but especially in Colombia. And especially in transitional justice, it has been a key year because of uh, maybe two main things. Uh, the first one will be that the Truth Commission's final report is, is out. It was the 28th of June. And that was something that we've been expecting for a lot of years. And the second thing would be that there has been like a big development regarding the cases that are um, judged in the like this in the special jurisdiction, the special police jurisdiction. Okay, the report is out. What is what is how did it get to be this report? Um, who was working on it? How long were they working on it? What did they do to gather facts, data, what have you, make their conclusions, and uh, ultimately write up the report? Um, it, it, we should know about that. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Uh, the report was made for from a um, couple of testimonies from victims from uh, you know from armed um, conflict, especially from the perpetrators, but also from the army. They interview a lot of people, so the victims, the FARC, the also the 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 army was interviewed. Some government officials. They also went to the some places where the where a lot of massacres happened and where a lot of 
like very specific and dark things from the history of this country happen. And they started to dig from there. Um, also, there are a lot of things that they said that were like confidential. It couldn't reveal the sources of the, the report, but they were like two sources and they were verified. And it has been like a, a process for the past um, five, six years, more or less. So it's it's been actually a, a key investigation and it's like a manual on the armed conflict and to reveal what actually happened during the past 50 years of war. Mm. Well, Colombia is, relatively speaking, Colombia is a democracy, am I right? Yes, you're right. But you had this problem with the, um, the, 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 the FARC problem, if you will. And there was a lot of murder and um, uh, unpleasantness and, and people victimized and killed and so forth for a long time. So if, if I ask you on the basis of your study and your you know, career and your education so far, where the Truth Commission fits in a democracy, what, what, what benefit does it provide to sustain the democracy, to preserve the democracy, to continue the democracy when you have a Truth Commission? Well, for instance, here, uh, the Truth Commission provides with the truth from what actually happened during the conflict. And to sustain this uh, whole democracy that we have, it's also very important to know what actually happened and what's like the root of the problem or what's the root of the problem. And if you know the root, then you can prevent the conflict from happening again from the same roots. And also um, the final report is actually being distributed and they're gonna like teach children since they're little what happened in their country and why is it so important that they actually know what happened here. So the future generations and the generations to come actually are informed of what happened here, how to prevent it, who were the perpetrators, like which were the, the people involved and the crimes committed. So it's also very important to sustain a, a, a democracy. Well, we don't know what, exactly what it's going to say, but uh, let's assume it, uh, you know, it discloses atrocity. Um, and let's assume that, that you, an ordinary citizen, now not a, not a special PEJ person, but an ordinary citizen, you read this report or you hear about this report in the newspaper, television, what have you. Um, what, what are you going to do being so informed in order to prevent this from happening again? What does the ordinary citizen do with the having the benefit of a report like this? The the ordinary citizens, um, I think something that happens here a lot is that the cities, the big uh, cities, are not actually communicated with the rest of the country. So what happened in the rest of the country, we don't know about it. So the atrocities and everything that happened everywhere, we're not really informed about it. We know what happened because the news or because um, we read it somewhere, but we're actually not true. And then the truth starts to be a gossip. And it becomes like, yes, someone told me that this happened in this place. Someone told me that this happened in this place. And actually, you don't have a one truth. You have multiple of it. So um, like the normal citizen needs to know what happened. Where do we come from? And what's next? Because if we don't have truth, then we don't have like a future. That's like the slogan of the Truth Commission. If we don't have truth, if we don't know what happened here, if we're not sure about it, or we or if we have uh, like doubts, then we're not gonna know what actually happened, how to solve it, and how to keep going as a as a country to be recovered from the <laughs> the past fifty years of war. So well, if I read the report and I understand, um, you know, a, a clear an ambiguous statement, a true statement of what happened. What do I do with that? Do, do, I, do I, I guess I talk to my friends about it? It becomes part of my public conversation. Maybe I write an article. What do I do in order to, in order to join in a kind of social movement to prevent this from happening again? Yes, you start, every person starts with their own like little pieces you said, like, 
you start reading the report, your friends start doing it, and then you start sharing like common views on what happened. And depending on on the, or on your line of work, or depending or your on your stance, because that happens here a lot. There's one side uh, to the conflict that says that the report is maybe not well done, that that's not the truth. And then you have another side that considers that the report is well done, that it's impartial, and that it actually answers to what the country needs. So what the report tries to do is actually stop this from happening, one side, the other side, but just like, this is what happened in the country. There's no one bad guy or another good guy. Everybody committed atrocities. Every actor in the conflict was like, um, a perpetrator or was a victim so that's something that the that the report seeks and then you as a normal citizen will know that um when you read the report you'll see okay maybe i was not right maybe i was wrong maybe i was right in this or in, in that when i was speaking and not spreading uh, a lot of information that might be fake or might be not accurate now oh, this is a very interesting look at it um, so, uh, but but the the whole agreement around the the FARC and the Truth Commission is that um, if if these people who committed atrocities will uh, own up to it, um, then they are what forgiven? Are they forgiven? Um, do they not suffer the punishment they might suffer? Uh, were there no Truth Commission? Was uh, if there were like war crimes trials instead? Do they do they walk away? Um, the Truth Commission has a different uh, perspective. It's just to know what happened during the conflict and present it to the people. But the HEP, that is the jurisdiction for peace, special for peace, they're in charge of what you're saying. And then in Colombia, there are three types of sanctions according to the to the peace agreement. There's some sanctions that uh, restrict rights and restrict uh, freedom of movement, but not into jail, but through special zones. Like house, there, or house arrest, that sort of thing? No, there's more like uh, you can go to this place, you can't maybe go to this place. That was a uh, um, more... more your civil liberties are limited. Exactly. More like restricting the civil liberties, but you're mm -hmm. not going to jail. Mm -hmm. Then you have an, another... another um, that are like alternative and it seeks to repair the victims. So for instance, uh, if you were part of um, a squad that maybe bombed the school and then you want to repair that school and you want to build it again, that's what the alternatives uh, look for. And then you have the ordinary sanctions that are like jail, that are 20, 15 or more years, 15 to 20. And that just happens if you don't tell the truth. So if I'm part of the FARC and I'm speaking uh, to the truth, to the um, hip, so um, then what you will do is um, if you don't tell the truth, well, you're going to jail. So the it's Truth the Commission point. can can refer you to the organization that can put you in jail. If the Truth Commission finds that you're not telling the truth, is that what happens? No. The Truth Commission just writes their report. It's already published. And what they do is th that they try uh, to get the report to, to as much people as they can. They also do it to the UN, uh, to the Security Council, to the Human Rights Council. The special jurisdiction for peace, they have also like a special unit to find out the truth according to the special case. So they are in charge of saying, you're not doing it right, or you, you're you lying. You did commit this crime. And in that case, and that would be that would be serious now, and you would wind up going to jail for exactly. not only the crime, but for lying about the crime. Exactly, yes. So I guess the 15 or 20 year punishment is relegated to the people who are serious criminals, war criminals. Yes, and it also can be a small, or a political um, crime, but if you lied about it, then you're not gonna get um, alternative or restorative sanctions. You're just, you're just gonna go to jail for 15 to 20 years. 
my my reaction is we should we in the United States should learn from you about this. <laughs> you know, Natalia, do you watch American TV? Do you read American newspapers? Do you, you hear about what's going on up here? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, you know, I asked you before about American immigration policy and, uh, you know, policy around uh, separating children from their parents and so forth. Uh, that must be a real problem, a real sticking point for anyone concerned about war crimes. And, uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, separating, uh, intentionally separating parents from children is a war crime. It's an atrocity. Do you agree? <laughs> that depends on how you look. At it because you're not in an in an armed conflict, but for the rest, I mean, it's an atrocity and it should be punished. Yes, I agree. I can... And so that it never happens again, mainly. Yes. So, um, yeah, you know, well, the U.S. has its issues these days, and I, I suppose uh, we 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 ought to learn from what uh, uh, Colombia does, and Colombia can learn what not to do from what we do. <laughs> So uh, I asked you before about the, the average citizen. The average citizen gets the report from the Truth Commission, and the average citizen tries to live his or her life in a way as to avoid atrocities again. But what about you, Natalia? You're going to see the Truth Commission report. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to you know, advance um, the lessons of the Truth Commission? Well. I, I I read a part of it because it has like eight thousand pages, so it's very long. Um, but what I've tried to do so far is try what I was just telling you. Maybe try to clarify some fake news that are evolving around the Truth Commission and the Peace Jurisdiction, because a lot of people are saying no, this is just made for the FARC to go. Um, to come like clean and then they won't have any repercussions and then the army will have every repercussion and it's going to be made um, just to wash children's brains and there's a lot of people that are actually saying that so what I've been doing so far is trying to maybe clarify more what the truth commission is saying they're not good guys they're not bad guys it doesn't say the FARC are the worst guys in the world. No, it says that every armed person or every um, actor in the armed conflict committed atrocities and they describe which ones committed, uh, was committed by, by who. Like, it actually describes everything. So I think that me as a citizen that is in, informed about the Truth Commission's report, that's what I've been trying to do so far. Hmm. That's a good experience, I think. And it's, um, truth is essential to democracy, which takes me to the next question. Is you you mentioned that you know people have they have questions uh, about uh, the report and and they have not been um, properly informed or not properly aware of what has happened all these years, um, and uh, that's troubling because in a democracy, presumably, you have the media. You have the press, you have newspapers. I know you have newspapers, and, and, and you have and you have television. So how come the media uh, was not able to accurately report what FARC was doing? How come the media was unable to, um, uh, you know, get the people to accept, you know, its its reporting on what the FARC was doing? Why is there this confusion now so as to require a truth commission? Couldn't the media have found all this out by itself? And couldn't the media have reported this a long time ago accurately? No, I think that the truth commission has also a very important asset and it's they're independent. Media here in Colombia is owned by certain political parties or not political parties, but certain political wings or um, maybe very powerful people. So they tell- yeah, we, uh, we don't have any of that in the United States. 
No, no, no. We we never see that happen here. Never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> but we do have that. So um, what the Truth Commission has is that they're independent. So every research that they're doing or that they did for the final report was independent. They got help from the UN. They got help from witnesses, from other NGOs. But they didn't get any help um, from the government itself more than maybe interviewing people. Or they didn't get any help from any political party because they're independent and they shouldn't be biased by any political um, well way. Mm, so mm. what they're doing is, what they did is very important because of that. Mm -hmm. Also, the media reported a lot of things, but it was very hard to get a lot of information here because there were towns where a lot of atrocities and massacres happened. Maybe the worst that happened in this country and nobody knew about it but days after it. And the truth was a little bit maybe partialized or they didn't know what happened. Every survivor was killed, so nobody knew what, what was actually going on. So it was very hard to actually know what was happening at the, at the time. Yeah, that's very troubling. I'll tell you one thing troubling about it is, you know, you talk about the, you know, the, the political, the sort of call it the capitalist control of media, which happens, as I was joking, it happens in the United States plenty, plenty. Uh, <clears throat> but um, couldn't that happen again? Because those structures that improperly restrained the media before and led to the necessity for a truth commission, independent truth commission, uh, those phenomena still exist, don't they? Those capitalistic structures still exist. So it could happen that, you know, suppression of the truth would happen again in Colombia. Am I right? Yes, you're completely right. I think that's a trouble that we're having, not just in Colombia, but worldwide. The, the media has been partialized. And then we, as the ordinary citizens, as you were saying, are a bit confused on the truth and what's actually happening. Mm. Well, it goes to another issue too, and that is, uh, is the FARC gone? Um, did the agreement ap uh, actually terminate um, the structures in the FARC? It's like, you know, we found, it took us a while to you know, get our hands on it, but we found that the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers here in the United States uh, were active organizations funded by, in large part by political interest and capital interest, um, were actively involved in the January 6th insurrection. Uh, coup, coup d'etat. Uh, it's all popular these days. Um, and uh, I, I guess uh, they're still around. There's been a handful of prosecutions, but relative to their existence, uh, I, don't, I don't think you could say they went away. And so what about the FARC? Did the, by virtue of the agreement and now the Truth Commission, did the FARC go away? Can we say there is no more FARC? No, that's actually something that wouldn't be accurate for me to say. So before there was numbers were like 30,000 uh, armed men, and now they're less. What they did is that they, uh, the the agreement terminated the FARC, but now we have a uh, like little uh, maybe organizations that were people from the FARC before, and they're actually uh, doing the same that the FARC did, but in a smaller structure. So the peace agreement did help because now we have much less men, much less atrocities happening at the moment. Uh, the problem with drugs has also been a bit uh, improved since the FARC. Um, Stop being an armed group, but we also have a lot of problems regarding uh, internal security. We have a lot of other armed groups that were born since the FARC left. So there's also a lot of issues that we have to keep working. It's funny. There's a there's a kind of parallel between the cities like Bogota, um, and I suppose there are other large cities in Colombia, um, and 
and and the, and the rural areas where the FARC ruled, um, and or may still rule, and uh, that you know this is a problem, which I have discussed with uh, Nicholas uh, Aron Sussman, who you know uh, with Project Expedite Justice. It's a problem is that you have two societies, you have two societies in in Colombia, and it breaks down. You know the uh, educated people, the people who appreciate these issues. The ones who preserve the democracy and you know reasonably responsible representative government are in the cities, but when you go into the rural areas, you find a almost a different world, and it's very hard to um, put the two together. Um, can we? Can you? We have the same kind of issue, you know: cities, host versus rural areas, um, and you see that. Popping up in in Trump's uh, you know base, uh, and so I I wonder if if there's a solution here to make the rural areas more Akamai. You know Akamai is a Hawaii word, uh, more smarter, smarter about about dealing with um, you know the problem that separates them from the centers of democracy. Um, can we fix that in Colombia? Can we fix um, that in the United States? <laughs> I think that it, it responds to two different things. In Colombia, it responds because here in Bogota and in the center, it's basically where every decision is made uh, budget-wise, politically-wise. So it's very difficult. Uh, they never think of the rural areas and they're forgotten. Another way that they're trying to improve that is through infrastructure. So they're trying to improve infrastructure for the government to be able to actually approach and enter into this um, into the cities and to mm -hmm. the smaller uh, places in Colombia. So that's also something that's been happening and we're trying to improve, but it's very hard for us to do it. Since we're a centralist country and everything that happens in Bogota is the decision that is made. Interesting that uh, I mentioned Juan Tello, who has also appeared on our shows and he's a lawyer like you, who specializes in infrastructure, uh, in raising money, um, organizing large contracts to build infrastructure uh, in uh, Colombia. And, and, the, and the mission is, is, just as you say, that if you connect the city with the rural area by infrastructure, and that, that includes roads, it includes railroads, it includes telecommunications, um, it's all connection. Um, then you, through that connection, you teach the people in the rural areas that there's a, another life and so forth. But doesn't that worry you, though, uh, Natalia? And if I build infrastructure all across Colombia and I show the people who are poor in the rural areas uh, the wonderful life they can have in Bogota, they will come to Bogota. And soon enough, everybody will be in Bogota. That may not help the rural areas. What do you think? No, I don't think that that would help. But that's actually something that's been happening here for a while. So, for instance, Colombia is a country of more or less 50 million people. And 12 million people live in Bogota. So, it has, it, it's been like this since the start of the conflict. Everybody's coming here just because they want to have a better life. Because they know that's what they can do for their children or for their families. Because it's very, very hard for them in the rural areas, especially because of the armed conflict. They've been displaced from their houses, from their homes. So it's, it has a, a way of saying it. And some people, they don't want to leave their places or their houses, their roots, their culture. But some of them would like to have a better life for their families as well. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, we we hear about um, about people who want to immigrate for sanctuary in the United States. Are they, are they coming from Colombia? Are they coming from the rural areas? Are they coming from Bogota and the cities? Um, are they coming at all? Do they need sanctuary? In the United States, are they making the trip? No, in Colombia, not that much. In Colombia, it's been more 
it happened uh, mostly during the 90s, where, this, where the armed conflict was was on a peak, uh, and the drug cartels were also running the country. Uh, mostly the people that go to the U.S. are uh, Central American people, Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador. There are countries that are very troubled politically right now, so it's mostly... Yeah. Well, we hear about that, and it makes us sad. Because what we would like to see is uh, Latin America united, uh, Latin America, you know, with leadership that goes beyond one country. Um, and, and we hear about all these political troubles and economic troubles, and we don't see solutions coming. And I've thought, you know, talking to you and, um, and Nicholas and Juan, that Colombia was a, a leading light, even with the troubles with the FARC and the troubles with the war crimes, the fact is that you do have a democracy and you are a, an important country that could be a leadership country in the, uh, what do you want to call it, um, the improvement of Latin America in general. Do you agree with me about that? Yes, I do agree with you in that uh, mostly Venezuelans immigrants are coming here because they want to have, better, have a better life than the one they have in their country. Yeah. And too bad there's so much trouble now in Venezuela and in Brazil now, and gee whiz, and governments are turning autocratic in Latin America and and elsewhere. I was telling you that I saw an interesting movie called uh, uh, Plaza Catedral, uh, which involved um, the wealth gap, if you will, and the education gap in Panama City, which is not too far away. Matter of fact, I think you're can. Are you contiguous with Panama? Uh, there's yes. your board, yeah. So people don't realize how many countries there are in, in middle, in, in Central America. Uh, but, and they don't realize that Panama actually runs west to east. And it's not north to south, it's west to east. And they don't realize that you're right there. And that Colombia touches Panama, and Colombia is Panama's entry, so to speak, into South America. Yeah? Um, so Panama City is a, is a city of steel and glass, of uh, wealthy people, um, a fair amount of corruption, I would say. Uh, um, and uh, in this movie, we learn about people who don't have um, two, two pesos to rub together, um, and they live uh, you know, across the street from people who are very wealthy and who live in the steel and glass and drive fancy cars and all that. How would you compare... Um, Bogota with, with Panama City. I would say that it has the same problems. Colombia is a country in which inequality is very high. I would say that one of the highest in the world. Uh, it's actually been very hard for Colombians because the middle class in Colombia is not very clear. So it's very, it's very hard to make it if you're not uh, from a good family or from a good education or you went into a um, government subsidized program that allowed you to study in a good university it's very hard because you have a very big gap and i would say that that's very similar to what you were describing the difference would be that um would would be and i would turn again to the to the armed conflict and it's that besides all this inequality you have victims from the armed conflict just uh, sometimes on the street, uh, just asking for help from others because they were displaced, forcibly displaced from their homes. It's very tragic, especially with kids, yes. especially with young kids. And, you know, and uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that if you do that for any length of time, if you have people who are displaced, especially young kids who, who really don't have a future in the existing society, the society itself is, is undermined. The society is corroded. You, you really can't have that wealth gap over any significant period without uh, you know, having a train wreck in, on your society in general. Um, so I wonder what you see for the future here, the future uh, of Bogota, the future of Colombia, the, the future of rural Colombia, um, the future of the people who might otherwise continue to engage in FARC-like activities. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously you're committed to the country. You're committed to doing the right thing. 
you're committed to making it better, but what do you see happening uh, in Colombia and uh, in Colombia as a, call it a leader in, in Latin American democracy? What, what do you see happening? Um, so since the last election, there was a new kind of government that was elected. It was uh, a bit more center right, center left, sorry, than the last government. And they're seeking to try to connect more with the rural areas to implement uh, the rural uh, reform that was um, in the peace agreement for them to be able to develop. They have a very different approach to, to drug the drug trafficking and the approach that we have uh, right now with the United States regarding exactly drug trafficking. And they have very different approaches regarding uh, health, regarding social security. So uh, I think that all of us uh, Colombians are just waiting for the best. Uh, and, and we are just like patiently waiting to see what the government does and every promise they made uh, during the campaign and every promise they made to the people to improve their lives and to actually uh, reduce inequality because that's also something that they want to do. We're just uh, waiting and patiently waiting to see if it happens or if something changes in the country without jeopardizing the, the economy that we have and the, and the institutions that we have now. So. So, may I say, God bless you for that. But what about running for office, Natalia, and being an activist and being part of <laughs> part of the political solution? What about that? I think I'm more of a lawyer than a politician. So I would rather work for um, a court, a human rights uh, advisor than uh, running for office. Okay. That, uh, let me <laughs> let me offer the thought that you may change your mind about that, <laughs> and it'll be okay if you do. <laughs> okay, I'll remember you if I do. Yeah, remember what I suggested for you. Well, in mm -hmm. French, we would say uh, "vous êtes très charmant." I don't I don't speak uh, Spanish, and what that means in English is uh, you've been very charming today, and I have greatly appreciated this discussion, Natalia, and I hope Thank we can too. circle back and and get an update from you as things go forward. It's been, it's been really a good discussion and I've learned a lot and hopefully other people will learn a lot too about mm -hmm. Colombia and about the, the processes in Colombia that we can learn from. Thank you, Natalia Venegas Arango. Thank Aloha. you, Jay, for having me. Aloha. <laughs>